Well, dear friends, now before the preaching of God's word, let us ask God's help. Shall we pray? O oh Lord our God, we thank you for the gift of the gospel. And you have entrusted the gospel to us. And tonight as we open up the mystery of the gospel, as we consider fresh the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for your help. O oh Lord, unstop our ears that we may hear you speaking to us instruct our minds and understanding and warm our hearts may we come to know and enjoy your love in christ more and more may the love of christ compel us to live and even to suffer for you in jesus name amen Well, tonight we shall continue our studies in 2 Timothy. And we are going to consider verses 8 to 12 of the first chapter. It is well condensed. Let me read to you these verses again. Paul says to Timothy, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. As we continue our studies in 2 Timothy, I must tell you that uh, I have considerable difficulties in expounding 2 Timothy. Let me explain. First of all, there's so much here in this letter that speaks directly to the minister. As I, as I prepare these sermons, as I preach to you, I don't know where to hide my face because God is speaking to me and I feel humbled, convicted, warned, instructed. I prefer to preach this to myself than to you. And if, another difficulty is that every phrase, every word, Every preposition here in this letter is so profound and helpful. We can linger on and consider every turn of the phrase, every preposition, but that would be too tedious. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, some years ago, preached 11 sermons on just verse 12. This is the book. I confess I haven't got the time to read these uh, 11 sermons before I come here tonight to preach to you. I wish I could, but not yet. So Lloyd-Jones, 11 sermon, just on verse 12. And you can be sure that Lloyd-Jones does not repeat himself, too often at least. You see how profound this is. And yet, 2 Timothy is not a systematic treatise like Romans or Ephesians. There is not much of a logical flow to this book. Uh, not much of a, a movement from doctrine to application. But there's much overlap 
in Second Timothy. And that makes exposition of this letter doubly difficult. Having said that, we're going to consider verses 8 to 12 tonight, and we're going to anchor our thoughts on three heads. The first, be not ashamed. Second, certainty. Third, experience of the reality and the power of the gospel. You'll notice in a sense, uh, verses 8 to 12 can be one unit, uh, brackets by this phrase, be not ashamed. In verse 8, Paul says to Timothy, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Paul is here saying to Timothy, I, Paul, your spiritual father, am not ashamed. So you be not ashamed. Or turn around, be not ashamed, because I am not ashamed. Be not ashamed of what? We ought to be ashamed of sins, whether they be our own sins, or our family sins, or our nation's sins. In some sense, we should be ashamed of being Australian because of our national sins. I shall not mention them. You remember Paul was much burdened by the sins of the churches he planted, whether they be the Galatian churches or the church in Corinth. He was so burdened, he was so grieved by how the Galatian churches went astray from the gospel of justification by faith, and he was so troubled by the many sins in the church in Corinth. We should be ashamed of sins. But Paul says here to Timothy, be not ashamed of what? Be not ashamed of the gospel. Be not ashamed of me. Verse 8 again. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Timothy, do not be ashamed of Christ, of his teaching, of the testimony to Christ, of the testimony Jesus bears to us. Be not ashamed of Christ and the gospel. And don't be ashamed of me, a spiritual father, the Apostle Paul. Why would Timothy be tempted to be ashamed of the gospel and of Paul? To start with, the gospel is Christ crucified. Can you imagine you were Timothy? You went to different places, you preached the gospel of Jesus, you preached a new religion. And people are going to ask you, whom do you believe? Oh, I believe in Jesus. Who is he? Oh, he's of Nazareth. He's our Messiah and your Savior as well. And what happened to him? Where is he now? You say, well, he was hung on a cross. Hung on a cross? Crucifixion was the most humiliating and shameful death in the Roman world. It was reserved to the worst kind of criminals or insurrectionists. Won't Timothy be tempted to be ashamed? The last that the world saw of Jesus was that he was crucified in weakness, in humiliation. The world did not see the risen Christ. Only the select witnesses saw the risen Lord Christ. Timothy would be tempted to be ashamed of Christ and the gospel. And then his spiritual father and mentor, Paul, is now in prison, waiting for judgment, most likely, as Paul anticipated, and it happened that way, was executed. If you got a relative in prison, 
Will you broadcast around? Will you not be tempted to be ashamed of such a relative? So we can understand why Timothy will be tempted to be ashamed of Christ and the Gospel and the Apostle Paul. Now think of ourselves. Think of our contemporary Australian culture. Christianity has been increasingly marginalized. It's not cool to be Christian in our time. And Christians are being depicted as narrow-minded, unloving, hypocritical, judgmental. That's the impression the world has of Christians. The world thinks of Christians as being a bunch of hypocrites. They do not live what they preach. They are secretly the most wicked kind of people. Recently we heard of a number of well-known Christian leaders giving up the Christian faith. They have become ashamed of the gospel. They have become ashamed of the Bible, of the teaching of the Bible, of Christ and the gospel. Now militant atheists have taken hold of the media, the academia, the big business, and the government, so much so that the Christian voice has been barred from the public square and increasingly even from private conversation. You don't bring up the gospel in the Christmas party. You don't bear witness to the truth in a family gathering because it is not allowed. It has become almost impossible to voice the Christian conviction and belief concerning something as basic and simple as marriage and sexuality. Just by bearing witness that God has said marriage, sexuality is for one man and one woman in a lifetime exclusively within a marriage bond, People think you are mad, or you are just pretending. People think this is discrimination. We too are tempted to be ashamed of the gospel. But here Paul tells Timothy, not just not to be ashamed of the gospel, but be brave enough to suffer for the gospel. Tell the truth. Stand for the truth. But prepare to suffer for it. In verse 8, share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Share with me, Timothy. I'm suffering for the gospel. Share my suffering. You'll be ready to suffer for the gospel. Verses 11 to 12. I've been appointed for the gospel a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. I'm suffering for the gospel because I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm a teacher of the gospel. I am sent by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you too, Timothy, you are a preacher, you are a teacher of the gospel. Share with me in the suffering. Joy with me in suffering for the gospel. We have, no doubt, we have no doubt whatsoever that Timothy himself is a man of great faith and a faithful minister of the gospel. But his weak body and his strong emotion could be a snare to him. And dear friends, we all have feet of clay. The bravest of us can be tempted to be coward. There will be times when we are tempted to be ashamed of the gospel. We may be tested to the uttermost in terms of suffering 
for the gospel. So this exhortation, this command, are not just for Timothy, but for the whole church in Timothy's days, in our time, and until the Lord shall return in glory. Friends, be not ashamed of the gospel. We prepare to suffer loss for the gospel. We move on. How can Paul be so courageous and bold in standing up for the gospel of Christ? It's because of his great confidence in Christ. Certainty. Look at verse 11 again. To which, which is to the gospel, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, in verse 12, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Why not ashamed? He goes on to say, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. I am suffering these things. I am in prison. I am waiting for the sentence. I am waiting for execution. But I am not ashamed. Why am I not ashamed? Because I know whom I have believed. Paul is so confident of the gospel that he is willing to suffer anything for it. What a saying. What a testimony. I know whom I have believed. The have believed there is the perfect tense. I stand as a believer. I stand believing. I know whom I have believed. I, have a, I heard of a testimony from the husband of a Christian woman who died of deadly disease. She was in a support group and people were there also with the same sort of illness and they were encouraging one another and one of them said to this lady, this Christian lady, I wish I have what you have. This Christian woman evidently was shining as a believer in terms of joy and peace and confidence. And people said, I wish to have what you have. She replied promptly, it is not what I have, but whom I have. What a testimony. How brilliant. How to sing. It's not what I have that you should cover. It's whom I have. Do not just cover what I have, but be sure you have whom I have. I know whom I have believed. Some older folks of us may remember years ago, Paul Yee Litu got two books. I only got one. His first one, his first book is called Know What You Believe. Second one, Know Why You Believe. I think they were published in the 1960s. Years ago. Half a century ago. Know what you believe. Know why you believe. But friends, we should also know whom we believe. Not just know what we believe, not just know why we believe, but we should know whom we believe. And in verse 12, Paul goes on to say, And I am persuaded, I am persuaded, that's a perfect tense again, but translated as the present, the sense is that I stand Persuaded, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Paul's long experience of God's faithfulness in Christ. And he says, I now stand 
persuaded from my long experience that God in Christ is able to keep what I've committed to Him until that day. God is almighty. God is mighty. He's faithful. He's able to keep what I've committed to Him until that day. Notice it is that day. It's not so much the day of death, but that glorious day of Christ's return. It's not just that to die is to be with Christ and to be better by far, but Paul is looking forward to God's power and faithfulness in raising him up from the dead, in giving him the resurrection body with Christ's glorious return. I stand persuaded that God is able to keep what I've committed to him until that glorious day. It's not a selfish obsession about what happens after death. Glorious as it is for a believer in Christ. But Paul has in mind here the coming of the kingdom of God at the last day. You notice here, Paul is utterly God-centered. Our greatest interest and desire and yearning should not be death and beyond death, but Christ's return in glory. You notice here, Paul is so confident of the faithfulness of Christ that he is willing to commit his all to Christ. I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Paul has committed his body and soul, his life and death, his wealth and well-being, everything he has committed to Christ. Are we willing to do so as well? With a long history of martyrs down through the ages, men and women of God, they may be weak in themselves, but they have great confidence in the gospel and the personal experience of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were willing to give up their all for Christ and the gospel. Not just the martyrs, but Christians down through the ages. The early Methodists was a gospel movement. And the Methodists in the 18th century, in the 19th century, they were doing tremendous work in England. And they have great confidence, personal confidence, in the contents of the gospel. And they also have deep experience, personal experience of the goodness and the sweetness of the Lord. Their minds were instructed, their hearts was warmed. I remember going years, years ago, uh, myself and my family went to Tasmania and we went to a place called Sarah Island. It was a terrible place, it was an island in the middle of the sea for the convicts. Uh, you will feel utterly depressed if confined there. But we were told, not by Christian people but by the tour guide, that there were Methodist missionaries going there to be with the convict to share the gospel with them. Who would do that? In an island full of convicts, not very nice people. Such a depressing scene. But they were so zealous for the Lord. They have such confidence in Christ that they were willing to go there and minister to the convict. We asked, how can we have such a confidence? Won't it be nice if we have such a confidence? Or can we have such a confidence? After all, we do not have a Damascus Road experience. We have not been caught up in the third heaven. We have not been able to perform miracles or even see miracles. We are not like Paul. How can we have his confidence to say that I know whom I believed? But friends, remember that Paul has to live by faith. The supernatural does not happen every day in Paul's life. 
God did not send an angel to release Paul from prison. Death was still something Paul had not experienced yet. Death was still something unknown to Paul. Paul has to live by faith. He has such confidence in Christ because he has experienced the reality and the power of the gospel. Now that brings us back to the previous verses. Back to verse 8. Paul says to Timothy, Now you suffer. But how do you suffer? According to the power of God. Timothy, I want you to be not ashamed of the gospel. I want you to suffer with me for the gospel, but not in your own strength, not in your own power, not in your own wisdom, but according to the power of God. Our third major heading, experience. Paul reminds Timothy that he has already experienced the reality and the power of the gospel. John Owen, the great Puritan, he distinguishes between the knowledge of the truth and the knowledge of the power of the truth. What's the difference? Let me explain. The knowledge of the truth is you know the doctrines. You know the objective truth. You have knowledge of the Christian truth and doctrine and theology. That is the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the power of the truth is a subjective experience of the reality and the power of the gospel. It's one thing to know doctrines. It's quite another thing to experience the power, the warmth of the gospel of Christ and of Christ himself. What is the gospel? Starting at verse 9, Paul sort of gives some items of the gospel. It's not a systematic exposition of the gospel, but Paul just mentioned quite a number of things here. Look at it, verse 9. God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And so he goes. Here Paul mentioned instinctively some aspect of the gospel. And there are actually quite a lot of doctrines he mentioned here. The point that he's making is that, Timothy, you have experienced these things. I'm going to give you seven words to anchor your thoughts and to unpack this passage somewhat. The first word is salvation. God who has saved us. To experience salvation is first of all to know and experience one's lostness. You come to know that you are lost, that you are in trouble, that you are condemned, and you cannot save yourself. And to experience salvation is that you know, first of all, your lostness, and that God has saved you. God who has saved us is the aorist tense in Greek, or the past tense, something happened. I know I've been saved from my lostness, from my condemnation, from God's judgment. So that's the first word, salvation. Have you known this? Are you saved? Have you experienced salvation? The second word, vocation. God has called us with a holy calling. Vocation literally means calling. God has called us to a holy living. Again, it's the Aorist tense here, the past tense. God has called us to live a holy life. 
The question is by definition someone who feels compelled and driven on to live a holy life. Is that true of you? That you feel compelled, you cannot do otherwise, that I must be holy. There's a divine holy compulsion. You can't help yourself, so to say. You hate yourself when you disobey God, when you sin. You want to be pure, you want to be honest. You want to be a person full of love, and when you discover that you fail that, you feel upset because you have received the holy calling, the vocation, this divine compulsion, God driving you on. You cannot live otherwise. You cannot be otherwise. Vocation. The third word, justification. Look at it. God has called us, no, saved us, not according to our works. Now this is almost like an instinct, a reflex in the thinking of the Apostle Paul. Here he is not expounding justification by faith as he does in Galatians and Romans. He's just by in passing, speaking to his own spiritual son, Timothy knows this thing very well. And Paul says, we are saved. We are called with a holy calling, not by our works, not according to our works. We are not justified by works, but by grace, not works at all. Oh, friends, do you know this? Do you feel that you can never be righteous with God by your own works? You say, I may try my best, but no, I can't be justified by God by my works. On the life which I did not live, on the death which I did not die, another's life, another death, I stake my whole eternity. The fourth word, election. Look at verse 9 again. We have been called not according to our works, but according to God's own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. The gospel is God's eternal plan of salvation. It's God's election. Tonight, dear friends, if you are saved, you know what? It's because God has chosen you in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's the teaching of the gospel. That's the reality. Not because we are good. Not because we are better. Not because we are more spiritual or religious. But because God has set his love on you before he created the universe. Oh, what a blessing. What a comfort. That God has appointed you and me to inherit eternal life. Election. The fifth word, revelation. The grace and the purpose of God that are given to us before the foundation of the world is now revealed in verse 10, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. The gospel is made known revealed by the coming of Christ is revelation by manifestation the gospel is from above is a revelation from God I remember years ago I was doing some evangelistic Bible study with some unbelievers uh, there was a scholar from China uh, he was a thinking man uh, even though he was doing engineering, but he was steep in philosophy and history and so on. And he said, well, Kushana believed in a word from above. He got it spot on, he got it right. Kushana is revelation. 
but not just revelation of some truth, but the revelation of a person, the manifestation of a person, the eternal Son of God in human flesh, the manifestation of Christ. The gospel is something accomplished in the death and resurrection of the Son of God in human flesh. Revelation, manifestation in the person and work of Christ. Our eyes are fixated on Christ, on who He is, what He has done. The sixth word, resurrection, in verse 10. By the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. My dear friends, the greatest enemy to mankind is death. Whatever our background may be, whether we are rich or poor, whether we've got education or no education, whether we live here or there, the greatest human concern is not to die. The greatest destroyer of all the hope and happiness is death. But we rejoice as Christ's people that Christ our Lord, our champion, He has abolished death by his own death. He brought life and immortality to light through his own resurrection. We still have to die unless Christ comes before that. Death is still our great enemies, but our champion, our Lord Christ, has conquered death and rose again. Because of that, we can be happy. In this Olympic, something amazing happened. Hong Kong has won a gold medal and two silver medals. The two silver medals are women freestyle swimming, 100 meters and 200 meters. And the people in Hong Kong, they are over the top. They are now so happy. It seems Hong Kong is moving on. That Hong Kong has its own identity and victory because they have these champions in the Olympics. You got something far greater, far more glorious than that. Well, we Australians, we have many medals in the Olympics. Big countries like the US and China and Russia, they have their medals, many of them. But for a small place, for a small country, for a poor country to get one gold medal in the Olympics is really something. Our champion, our champion, our champion are not the Olympians, it's Christ, resurrection. The last word, proclamation, in verse 11, to the gospel I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. The gospel has content, it has to be taught, it's a good news to be proclaimed. The gospel has facts, and the apostles were sent to bear witness to the fact of Christ's miracle, his death for sinners, his resurrection, his ascension, and so on. Well, I know this is really a lot, isn't it? Now you know the difficulty in expounding this letter. Paul packed so much into so few words, but not in a systematic way. It doesn't have to unpack or tease out this truth for Timothy. Timothy knows this thing. What Paul is saying here is to remind Timothy, Timothy, my dear spiritual son and personal assistant, you have experienced 
the reality and the power of this gospel truth. You've experienced that. Christianity, my dear friend, is not just talk, mere ideas or doctrines. Christianity is not word alone, but truth experience in one's mind and heart and life. Orthodoxy is vital. Doctrines are essential. But dear friend, you and I must also experience the power of the truth by faith. We must taste that the Lord is good. We must know the living Christ. We must be like George Wefield, the 18th century evangelist. We feel cry out, I want to felt Christ. I do not just want a doctrinal Christ. I want to felt Christ. I want to know him. That I may make him known. O oh, friends, may God help us and bless us. That you and I can say with the Apostle Paul, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Shall we pray? Lord our God, we bow before your sovereign majesty. We worship you for you are the God of love. And tonight we cry out to you that we want to know you and to make you known. Help us, O oh God. Turn us that we may turn to you. Speak to us that we may speak your truth. Oh, give us that blessed communion with Christ. May we know what it means to abide in Christ, to draw from the life of our risen Lord Jesus. Oh, we cry to you that the Christian faith may not just be talks and doctrines to us, but that we may experience His reality and His power. O oh Lord, we pray for your church. We pray that you may visit your people in a time like ours, that your people may know you and bear witness to your name. Come, O oh God. We are dry and bare. We are cold and lukewarm. Oh Lord, so much of your church is in unbelief and is being led astray. And for those of us who know the truth, we have experienced so little of the power and the reality of the gospel. Oh, forgive us. Speak to us. Give us faith. Increase our faith. Oh God, come. Make bare your arm. Visit your people. Give us life. All for Jesus' sake. Amen.